Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. We love Portland, and as I said, we hope to have an ongoing relationship with you guys. Um, so, I first of all want to talk a little bit about the nature of the conference and then come to real wealth and explain that for many people it might seem very odd to have this combination on the one hand, you know, paleo diet, on the other hand, the magic vision of Charles, and on the other hand, uh, measurements of, you know, new measurements for GPI instead of GDP, a very broad mix we have here. I actually think that developing a certain axis for thinking of this can be helpful. I know that my colleague Charles will probably think of this as too Western and intellectualized, but I think that a certain axis to see the framing of all of this can be helpful. So our axis comes from having worked simultaneously in the least industrialized, urbanized parts of the world, and on the other side of the world, in your country, the most industrialized, the most urbanized, the most corporatized country in the world. Now, working on those extreme polar opposites in the world led us to come up with this bigger picture that we, that we stand by and that we think is very useful. Now, as it turns out, that big picture is also about looking at where we are right now and where we might want to end up, or where we want to be. And as I try to say in my book, Ancient Futures, I see an intuitive turning, very similar to what Charles is talking about, there's an intuitive turning towards the magic, the beauty, the mystery, and the life of the natural world, turning towards nature. There is a huge shift going on where we are often in unconscious ways turning back to what ancient nature-based embedded cultures knew all along. That is, we are the natural world. Our health, the health of Mother Gaia are one. Our polarizing intellect, you know, from our left brain, which only allowed us to see from here up and where we started joining into this fragmented way of looking at the world, that we are separate from nature, that everything else can be understood by slicing it into neat slices, creating this reductionist, fragmented view through which we view the world. We're beginning to turn away from that in a million and one ways. I mean, there are so many practices, of course, meditation being the most fundamental, but there are even now technologies that are probably quite valid in helping us to balance our brain back to a better equilibrium between that left brain, which we do need every time we take an action, we are using a type of analysis or reductionism, but every time we, we calm down and slow down and to contemplate the whole, it's the other side of the brain. So there is this ancient futures turning going on that we often don't see. But we believe, passionately believe, that as I was saying um, on the in the opening evening, that we actually need to engage in a bit of both. In other words, we need what we often call both resistance and renewal. On the opening evening, I said something about practicing creative schizophrenia. And someone came up to me and said, don't, don't use that word. Uh, I suffer from schizophrenia, don't, don't use that word. So I take that back. <laughs> Another way to talk about it is that we need to engage in both resistance and renewal. The resistance part has to do with understanding that out of this trajectory where we started fragmenting our worldview and where we went along with the belief that we are separate from nature, 
that that trajectory has continued in an economic system. It is a techno-economic system of big money linked to technology, taking us further and further away from the natural world, carrying us without us seeing the process. So in order, uh, so, so one of the things that we need to do in terms of resistance is to understand what is that trajectory? How is that working? And as I think I said on the opening evening, it's crucial and really empowering to understand that the trade treaties, bilateral, multilateral, under WTO, outside the WTO, these, this has been a thread, a vehicle, whereby our political leaders have gone along with deregulating global banks and corporations. Deregulating the multinationals has been about giving them freedom and that freedom, as I said the other night, is about them being allowed to sue our government if our government protects the environment or our health or our well-being, our jobs. So please, please do pay attention to that. It will mean a bit of your intellectual left brain engaging. Don't have to become an economist. Do not have to read those trade treaties, which by the way, only teams of lawyers can decipher. They are made by teams of lawyers, four teams of lawyers, who work for the corporations, and those same lawyers can represent a corporation in the morning and in the afternoon they can stand as judges in these tribunals where the corporations sue government. It's utterly mad. We would be laughing this out of court, out of our world, out of our society, if we just knew about it. So there is this invisible thing going on in a trajectory that takes us further away from what we long for, which is that deeper connection. So do commit to at least devoting a little bit of your time to that resistance while giving at least an equally big chunk of your time to the renewal. And what does the renewal look like? Well, I, I uh, a while back, I, I made a bit of a list of the wealth that this ancient Ladakhi culture had that I knew so intimately, and also Bhutan, where I worked over a five-year period. In these cultures and others that I came to know, there was this incredible real wealth. And these are just some of the factors that that wealth consisted of daily exercise and movement. But we're talking hours. We're not talking about running in frantically to a gym, you know, to spend half an hour. We're talking about most of the day being able to move with your body. And I hope you know the doctors who are now urging us to get up from our computer every 15 minutes just to move about. One of the best things we can do for longevity and health. They had fresh, healthy, local food as a given. They had plenty of time, and as we've been hearing, the importance of time, plenty of time. Leisure time and you know, time to do everything at a human pace. We are running after our technologies. We need another whole conference just to look at how we're ending up trying to keep up with the speed of our technologies, rather than allowing our technologies to really serve us. This is why we're running so fast. Everyone engaged in song, music making, and dance. Another incredible gift. It's one of the most wonderful things we can do together to celebrate life, to feel our own empowerment. Singing is like an inner yoga, just the breathing. And as we sing one tone together, it's one of the closest ways of coming to that sense of spiritual connectedness. Meaningful work, meaning that people had the, the right and the ability to see the product of their labors, to actually see that they had done something, accomplished something. There was no such thing as unemployment. And remember, there are still many cultures living in what we call the poorest of the poor parts of the world that have this wealth. No unemployment. 
you felt empowered because along with that economy where you could see the products of your labor and where you were actually engaged in doing something productive, you were living at a scale where you could see that your voice, your productivity actually translated into power over your own self-determination. We need localization for all these reasons, but that's one of the key reasons. We need to decentralize so that we have that greater power and determination over our life. We're not going to go back to decentralizing to the extent of these traditional cultures, but there are certain key elements like this that I believe we must regain. Maybe the, one of the most important gifts was that in a more human scale community fabric, as young people grew up, they had the great privilege of being loved for who they are, being seen close to hand, knowing that the love and the support they were getting came from people who knew them as they were, not because they were wearing the Nike running shoes or looked the right way as the media was determining. Part of that was, of course, this community web where you had a sense of interdependence. Vicky has already spoken beautifully about it. So the interdependence where you know you can count on your neighbor and your neighbor knows they can count on you, in that situation you have a natural gift culture. There's so much that gets exchanged without needing money to intervene. However, from where we are today, it's clear that we do need money to make the transition and ultimately we'll probably want to end up with a certain degree of monetarization but a massive step towards decommercialization. The community fabric, and I talked about that earlier, central to that was the intergenerational fabric where old and young were together day and night. An incredible wealth for both the young and the old. Access to wild nature. Being able to peek into the miraculous wealth of wild nature and having that usually as a daily experience. And that in turn was completely inextricably tied to beauty, to beauty as Sandra was talking about yesterday, to the beauty of the natural world. And this in turn was also part of a, a cultural way of being where your spiritual connections to the living world and to other human beings, your spiritual connections were an experience of every day linked to traditions of quieting the mind, of quite consciously encouraging a spirituality which, as I experienced it in these cultures, was more along the lines of what Eckhart Tolle um, says in The Power of Now. In other words, it took me many years to realize that what I was witnessing was people who were moving in and out of that expansive, quiet mind and space and then saying, how are you today? Did you go to the village today? And then again, oh, mani padmahum, as they spun their prayer wheel. And then back again to continue the conversation. So literally mid-sentence, I came to realize that people moved in and out of that quiet space that Catherine described earlier today. So this is why, this is a little bit of an explanation, why we're covering such a broad church, but how it's all connected, because everything in life is connected. Thank you. Woo!